But this question really touches on something that you brought up before, which is that there are many wisdom traditions over thousands of years that have said very, very similar things. And, 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 and in some sense, as a scientist, I'm sort of a Johnny come lately, right? Science is sort of a Johnny come lately to this, but, but the science is, is, is coming along. But, but the kind of answer to the question that you just raised will require that we take all the insights from the wisdom traditions and then we also take the rigors of the scientific method in terms of theory building and careful testing and bring these together in a, a synergistic interaction so that we we find out from the wisdom traditions deep deep insights right they they were there first in terms of saying uh, space time is not fundamental like the physical world is not fundamental and they've given us some informal pointers to what might be beyond, right? There, there's no mathematics there, there are, right? So now, now the Johnny come lately, science can, <laughs> hey, we, we, now, we now, we realize that space time is doomed, that, that there's something deeper, and we can now start to build mathematical models that try to capture some of the insights of the wisdom traditions. And we can have this back and forth now between our intuitions on the one hand, and then our attempts to make them precise, and, and why do we do that? Is it just to be pedantic and to be, you know, over the top with mathematics? It's not that at all. It's that in some sense, you don't really know what you're saying until you say it so precisely that you could be wrong. That's when you are beginning to know what you're saying. So we will use in, in formal words, you know, in the, in the wisdom traditions, including words like God. And if I ask you precisely, what's the definition of God? You, you won't find it anywhere. So um, what we need to do is to try to make these intuitive ideas that the tra traditions have, they're probably genuine insights, make them absolutely precise so that we can then learn and be surprised. Like, so for Einstein, for example, in I think around 1907 or so, he had this fundamental insight about gravity, that if it was in something like an elevator that was free falling, that you would you would find, and you had a, a you know a, a, something that could weigh you in the elevator, you'd find that you were weightless, you wouldn't weigh anything inside the elevator. And he and he said that was like the happiest thought of his life because it was it was the insight that gave him the general theory of relativity. But it took him something like eight years of struggle, really tough emotional struggle, sleepless nights, pulling the hair out kind of kind of stuff to turn that insight into finally in 1915 or something like that, he got, he wrote down the equation. And that's what it really means to say, if I was in an elevator, I would be weightless. But what it, and the reason you do it now is because then the mathematics is smarter than the person who wrote it down. That mathematics that Einstein wrote down he didn't know it, but it entailed the existence of black holes. And when someone else, a year later, after he published it, some, uh, some guy in the front lines of World War I, actually, working on the equations, discovered, um, this guy named Schwarzschild, discovered this solution to Einstein's equations that there are these black holes and Einstein did not like it. He disbelieved in black holes for decades. So here's a case where we write down our, we take our ideas, including these deep spiritual ideas that we've had for thousands of years. We write them down mathematically, not merely to be pedantic so that we can actually learn what we were talking about all along. Yeah. Falling in an elevator and being weightless means there are black holes. Well, who would have ever figured that out? And so the things that we say in the wisdom traditions, they're going to mean all sorts of other things that we had no clue that they meant yeah. until we get serious and write them down. So that's why I want to see this synergistic um, interaction between science and spirituality, like where we take the insights from the one and the rigor of the other, and then we learn, we get surprised. And that's, that's, that's the hope. 
Wow. Yeah, that's so well articulated. Um, the you you said this in another um, <clears throat> in another way as well that you become a student of your theory that the equations become smarter than the genius that wrote them down. That right. you're, you're, you're it's so spot on um, that that the the <clears throat> the flag that we plant beyond the edge of knowledge that we create hypotheses towards that just flowers a whole nother field that we weren't ready for we didn't know yet existed and the science of spirituality are those two driving forces that have gotten us um so far and that to where we are and so to bring them together and harmoniously test them i like using the the description where you think about like would have we done the manhattan project and dropped nuclear bombs on hiroshima and nagasaki if our science community was a little bit more spiritually, ethically, morally, philosophically awakened. But would we also, would we, would we, um, would, would we have all of the peddling of snake oils if our scientific method was stronger to analyze those um, snake oil salesmen? So there's, there's that as well. So there, these things, they, they, they come together like peanut butter and jelly. <laughs> they really could. And, and, I, you know, there's been this long-standing um, antipathy between science and spirituality that you know, has some interesting historical roots. In particular, for example, the the treatment of Galileo by the Catholic Church. Yeah. Right? I mean, and 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 Alan Turing, even in the last uh, hundred years. Yeah. And that was yeah, that was um, uh, a society that was um, that really cruelly attacked him for being homosexual. Homosexual. Yeah. Right. So, so, in, in, so, so there's been this long standing antipathy be between science and spirituality, at least since Galileo and, and the Catholic Church. And, and Giordano yeah. Bruno burned at the stake. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that, that's the kind of stuff that, 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 that we don't want to have happening. And, and that's why it's, it's really critical to walk away from dogmatism. Yeah. Right. That's, that's dogmatism is the source source of all this, and it, you know it seems like um, most spiritual traditions would recognize that that humility is a virtue, yeah. and I would include in that humility about my beliefs, humility that I could be wrong, um, and especially when we have hundreds of different religious systems, many of which in the past have said that I'm right and all the other religions are wrong. Now, now we know that at most one of those hundreds could be right, right? And, and what's the probability that it's mine? And, and so, so instead of going in that whole framework, it's, it's rather, why not have an attitude of, right, what, whatever the ultimate reality is, surely there's compassion for my ignorance and for what I got wrong. And there's, it, it, it's, and, Surely the, 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 the most healthy way for us to proceed is to listen to each other and to share. I don't have to believe what you say. You don't have to believe what I say. But, but I also don't need to kill you if you dis disagree with me. You don't need to kill me if I disagree. You know, and, and instead, we can have this, this humility to listen, maybe agree to disagree. Um, and then maybe later on in 10 years, I realize, oh, I was deeply wrong. And, you know, Sharon over there, she was deeply right. And I just didn't see it at the time, but I've grown up and now I see it. So, so just giving ourselves the time and the space to, to grow up and to, to learn uh, humbly. And, and, and that's the way I feel about the science. I mean, I, I'll say this, I love scientific theories. The, I study them, they're incredibly beautiful. And I don't think I've ever seen a true scientific theory. I think all scientific theories that I've studied so far are deeply false. They're the best we have so far. Yeah. But they're good enough in many cases to tell us where they're false. And that's the power of a theory where it, where it tells you yeah. where it gets off. And that's what I want in spirituality. There's a, a theory in spirituality that's good enough to tell me where it is inadequate and where it's beckoning me to now go for a deeper theory with a different level of understanding, but its own new inadequacies. And Gödel is suggesting that um, we will be doing this forever. <sighs> 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 
Don, I feel like the the edge pushing that's happening around um, bringing together science and spirituality, the edge pushing that's happening around um, understanding our source code, um, that that the, the topics that we've talked about and understanding that ultimate reality, um, I, I feel like um, the word integral and integrality are a very important um, phrase there because of um, just it, the integral and the derivative, but the integral in the sense of the integration of all um, perspective, but the d derivation in the sense of the um, each one of us having a unique experience in that candy store. Um, right. So yeah, yeah, and and in a unique artistic contribution or gift to bring to the world, and and um, that that's that's the ninety nine point nine percent genetic similarity integral and the point one percent genetic difference differentiation. Um, so that, yeah, go, yeah, go ahead. Absolutely. I, I, I think you raised an incredibly important point to view each person that you meet as a gift. They have a new perspective that's different from yours. And, and rather than putting up barriers to things that are foreign and novel to recognize that here's a chance for me to explore something that I, that I might not have ever, ever explored without interacting with this person. And you know, this person, maybe I'm a geek that likes mathematics, and this person is an artist who likes painting and photography. Um, I can learn from their perspective, and they, they can learn from mine. And, and I can appreciate um, if I'm willing to open up and humbly listen and, and really listen, because I may not have the concepts yet. I may not have the point of view to really understand what that person is saying. Yeah. In which case, um, it's even more important for me to put in the time and effort because I'm going to have more to learn there. There's more that I can, can grow from that. So, so having that kind of view of, of our differences, that they're an opportunity to learn, to expand our horizons, um, and to realize that that, in some sense, perhaps is what life is all about, is constantly expanding our horizons and constantly um, in, enjoying new vistas. Yes. The vistas that we've had, we like to sit in our own vistas and say, this is it. Yeah. Hey, you know, that next mountain may have something even more fun. Yeah, the constant exploration of the Infinite Candy Store. I love this. It seems to make the most sense um, of the alternative being we already are all of the Infinite Candy Store combinatorics um, eternally happening. And that has a little bit more of maybe a, a nihilistic eternal return sense to it that we've been here before. We're doing this again. Um, but the the other one, the idea that there is just, it's never going to end the, the infinite exploration. Um, it has a little bit more adventure and it has a little bit more Darwinian metaphysical implications to it as well, where um, we need to take this seriously. We need to take our um, rock orbiting of the star very seriously because um, if, if as above, so below, another spiritual wisdom is true. That's also scientifically validated that if natural selection is happening here between us, natural selection is all could also be happening at this cosmic level, not only in our universes, but universes competing um, against one another for that recursion and how likely it is that, that they themselves get to those next tastes in the, the qualia uh, candy store. That's quite possible. That would be something I would really like to explore in this dynamics and graphs of, of conscious agents to see what, what in the world's going on here and what kind of dynamics are we using maybe to explore the candy store? Absolutely. Yeah. Don, I'm so, so grateful for this conversation. Thank you. Thank you for everything that you're doing and that you've inspired so many people to think in refreshing and new ways and push the edge of what's known. We're very grateful to you. Thank you. Thank and to you. all your lab, to all your students and lab and teammates um, as well. That, that's very important. The people behind the groove of the song. Right. Oh, absolutely. I couldn't have done it without uh, my graduate students and my, my collaborators. You know, you know, and I could name a bunch of them that, that um, frankly, um, push my ideas around all the time. And that's how I learn. <laughs>